Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. It's my privilege to introduce our chapel speaker this morning. Dr. Don Campbell is our President Emeritus and Professor Emeritus of Bible Exposition and has served faithfully at Dallas Theological Seminary for uh, well over 50 years. Uh, He joined the faculty in 1954. In addition to his ministry here, he has served on various boards for evangelical ministries, schools, as well as mission agencies. He's also written a number of books, articles, and uh, a myriad of reviews. Uh, Dr. Campbell has uh, held probably every uh, administrative office uh, academically possible on Dallas Seminary, from registrar through uh, all of the academic uh, process all the way up to president and now continues uh, to serve with us as president emeritus. He has been a friend for many, many years. Uh, He's experienced in the job that I try to do. He is a source of great counsel and I deeply appreciate his friendship as well as his collegiality on our campus. Uh, He's married to his wife, LaVon, who could not be with us today. Uh, Together they enjoy uh, their six children and 14 grandchildren. Uh, Would you join me in welcoming and honoring our beloved Dr. Campbell? According to Elton Elton Trueblood, philosopher, theologian, emeritus means, it's from two Latin words, it means he's out and he deserves to be. Or I might say, he's out and he's glad to be. (laughs) A number of years ago, when I hired Chaplain Bill, uh, I was the one giving the orders. Things have changed. (laughs) And uh, he now tells me how long to speak. (laughs) And what to speak about. (laughs) The passage I am to address in this chapel He knows that this is a difficult time in my family. I was, uh, for some years, uh, during my years as president also, uh, I was a caretaker for my wife, B, who, died 19 years ago of metastasized cancer. And uh, she had blessed uh, this campus, teaching seminary wives the Schofield Correspondence Course in our home. She launched MOPS with uh, Shirley Bryan as teacher, uh, with Andy Underwood, the wife of the board chairman. Uh, She launched in its present form, uh, Luke's Closet and the Food Pantry. But the Lord saw fit to take her home 
was my privilege to be a caretaker for her. Months passed and I called her widowed sister in California. And I said, would you, I'm lonely, would you come and live with me? <laughs> and she said, yes, but you have to marry me first. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, I knew that was part of the deal. Some months ago, I received a very disturbing phone call from uh, California. Her middle son, Tom, had taken his own life. Tom was a loner. He lived up in uh, the hills uh, near Squaw Valley. I uh, stood many times on his porch uh, looking over toward the hills and in the direction of Sequoia National Park. It was a beautiful spot. He was a very bright man. He was a loner, single and something snapped, and he ended his life. And in, in a family discussion, someone said, well, well, Tom violated one of the Ten Commandments when he killed himself. And my son Tim said, with some measure of irritation, and who is there among us who has not broken at least one of the Ten Commandments? My text for the funeral, we flew to California, to Fresno, and my text was 2 Corinthians chapter 5, which uh, Chaplain Bill assigned to me for this morning. So, will you look with me at life and death from God's perspective for the believer? In chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, we have three contrasts uh, concerning a believer's life. First is the contrast in verses, verse 16 between the outer and the inner person. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outer man, our outwardly, I think NIV renders it, outwardly, we're perishing. Outwardly, we're wasting away. Tell me about it. <laughs> In, inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. Classmate uh, Ray Stedman said one, one day from this platform in chapel, uh, 
he looked into the mirror and he said, mirror, mirror on the wall, you've got to be kidding. Uh, what's, what's a young man like you doing in a body like that? Well, the, the outward person is perishing. The second contrast is between present troubles and future glory in verse uh, 17. Hard to get a focus here. Uh, present troubles. Paul describes them as light and momentary. If you read the passage above, as well as the 12th chapter, where he rehearses a litany of his troubles in ministry. You will say light and momentary. How can you say that, Paul? Life is not without its, its troubles, its trials, its sorrows, its disappointments. Some of you already have faced that. Inevitably, probably we all shall. But Paul said, it depends on the perspective. They're light and momentary. When placed alongside the glories of the future, the weight of glory, In Romans 8, Paul said, I know that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glories that shall be revealed in us. So Paul concludes that the sufferings of the present are weightless trifles when placed alongside the glory that is to come. A third contrast is between the temporary and the eternal. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. He said, we, we do not look at the things which are seen. <clears throat> oh, but Paul, we do. We, we are gripped by what is seen. Literally, he said, we don't fix our gaze on what is seen. Well, but we do. We shouldn't. But we're gripped by the material. But we look at the things which are not seen. Now, that's an interesting expression. How do, how do you look at something you can't see? Well, Hebrews 11 answers that. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. John Wesley called faith the fifth 
sense. William Kelly was a student at Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland. He excelled in his major, which was Greek. When he graduated, he was, even as a young man, offered a position on the faculty. He said, no, thank you. Well, they were flabbergasted, so they appointed a committee that usually is a good administrative solution. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> the committee waited on William Kelly in his home and it made the offer again immediate position on the faculty of this esteemed college in Dublin. He said, again, I must say no. And exasperated, one of them said, young man, this would make you famous. And he said, in whose world? He, he didn't seek fame in this world. And realistically, he never achieved it, but as a Bible student, a Bible teacher, an author of great expositions of scripture, which hardly anyone reads anymore because they are so voluminous, he achieved fame in the world to come. The temporary versus the eternal. I think the focus of those verses, those contrasts, the outer versus the inner, present troubles versus future glory, and the temporary versus the eternal, eternal, this is about the life of the believer. Now, moving on into the next chapter, verses 6 through 8. Again, we have three contrasts. In verse 6. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that we are at home in the body. We're absent from the Lord. We walk by faith. Notice how Paul makes a distinction between himself and his body. I see a lot of bodies out there. I'm not really seeing you. You are a spiritual personality living in the body, which in the opening of this chapter, Paul calls a tent dwelling. Fragile, impermanent, a tent. At home in the body. Therefore, secondly, away from the Lord. The Lord is physically in heaven. I know by his spirit he indwells us. But the Lord bodily is, is in heaven. And 
we're away from the body. And thirdly, we walk, we live by faith. Then between verses 7 and 8, something happens. Death or the rapture of the church, whichever comes first. It, it's appointed to all people to die once. It says the writer to the Hebrews, William, William Sorohan, a, a Nobel Prize winner, a literary critic, visited this country. He felt deathly sick. In fact, he was dying, I think it was in a Philadelphia hospital. He picked up the phone and he called the editor of the paper. He, and he said, I've, I've always known that everyone had to die but I thought an exception would be made in my case. What now, he said. Hung up the phone, and shortly he died. Then, then there's Donald Trump. He, he, He's called the Donald. I've made peace with that. <laughs> according, according to the Dallas Morning News, it, it quoted several years ago, the Donald. He said, uh, I don't worry, not even about death. He said, I, I prepare for things. I'll ultimately, he said, we all end up going. He said, I, I don't believe in reincarnation, heaven or hell, but we all go someplace. Do you know, he said, for the life of me, I cannot figure out where. Tragedy. This great financier, this man of tremendous wealth and power, total agnostic regarding the life to come. I have prayed that somebody might have contact with that man and explain the good news of the gospel to him. Death, I have sat in the presence of death. When, uh, when B died, it was a Friday afternoon and I, was at my desk. She was in the bedroom four or five feet away. I sensed that things were changing. Her breathing became very shallow. I went in and sat by her bedside 
and suddenly she was in a coma. She opened her eyes. She looked straight up. She raised her hands. And I said to her, honey, what do you see or who do you see? She didn't answer me. She lowered her hands one soft breath and she was gone. She had been at home in the body. Now she was at home with the Lord. She knew where she was going. At home in the body, away from the Lord, walking by faith, and then death or the rapture, then that changes everything in verse 8. Away from the body. She moved out of the body. There comes that time when we, if the Lord doesn't come first, when we will depart the body, vacate the body. The body sleeps, not the person. Away from the body, at home with the Lord, at home in the body, now at home. I love that expression, at home with the Lord. Last part of verse 7, walking by sight. Now we walk by faith, then we shall walk by sight. Can you imagine the sight, the sights? The Lord, of course, will look in his face, in the faith of face, faces of loved ones. We, we will see the beauty and the glory of heaven that is beyond our human imagination. We won't walk by faith any longer. We'll walk by sight. George MacDonald, who was a me mentor for C.S. Lewis, a Scottish uh, literary man and minister, he said, if we knew as much about heaven as God does, we would clap our hands every time a believer dies. Jack Wordson wrote a letter to her friend back in the days when people wrote letters. Uh, and he said to his friend, who had been very ill, glad you're still in the land of the living. And the man wrote back immediately. He said, no. I am in the family of the dying, and I'm going to the family of the living. Finally, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. 
pastor, evangelical pastor in Germany. Participated in a plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. It failed. He was arrested. Sentenced to death. On the way to the gallows, he was heard to say, the end of life, the beginning of living. Life my young friends, life can be hard, but God is good. And I affirm to you that his grace is adequate. It's sufficient. He cares.